Uh, what I want to talk about today is, is FPGAs, Field Programmable Database. Um, and what's fun about this is that they've gotten uh, cheap enough where you can actually consider playing around with them as a hobbyist. And this is this is great fun, uh, in part because of just you know Moore's Law going along, and also in part because of you know cheap Chinese electronics, which to me just just done all kinds of stuff. Uh, let's see, so I'm Stephen Edwards. I nominally teach computer science at Columbia. So, you know, rented a car, drove down here uh, just to do this. Uh, let's see, uh, my greatest uh, professional achievement is if you type Stephen Edwards into Google, I'm number one. Um, and you can find these slides uh, uh, and the files I'll be talking about and the rest of it. So, the whole business this will live on your path. Um, so, the punchline is we're going to take a difficult to find uh, but phenomenally simple processor trainer, the Pin 1 from 1976, and put it on to what is already an antique uh, field programmable data rate. Uh, but what's great about this is you can go on this uh, and um, uh, let's see, my favorite website is banggood.com. It's like crack to electronics hobbyists. Yep. Um, 16 bucks. Oh my god. And this is yeah. This this used to be you know you know hundreds or you could spend thousands or you know, maybe even tens of thousands of dollars on that FPGA stuff if you work work at it without too much difficulty. This is cheap enough where, oops, I blew it up. I'll buy another one. Not too bad. Okay, um, let me talk about what we're not going to talk about: software emulation. This is fun too. This is not what we're going to do. Uh, software emulation is writing software that tricks other software into thinking it's running on the original hardware, but of course it isn't. And this is great. Um, I discovered MAME years ago, and some, I don't know how many hours of my life into it. Um, uh, MESS is more, more our speed, where they've, they've done a whole bunch of old systems, you know, again, mostly for playing games. What else is there in life? But uh, it's good stuff. I, uh, this is code I, I went and just found in the 6502 emulator, and you find stuff like this, right? This is how to code in C, the incredible detail of this is the decimal mode of the 6502. It's a little bit more straightforward when you're doing binary, uh, so forth and so on. Great stuff. SimH is right up our alley. You can go and uh, uh, download uh, Unix disk images from 1973 or something like that and run them on an emulated PDP 11. Marvelous, marvelous stuff. You know, go knock yourselves out. That's not, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Okay, so what is an FPGA? An FPGA is not a processor, it's not a stored program computer. There is no notion of a program counter, um, the notion, there's no the notion of restful memory. What it is, is a sea of lookup tables. And so this. You know, this is sort of the only real thing I care about you, you remembering from all of this. Uh, a lookup table, so this has four inputs in it, which means it's a 16-bit RAM. And so the way you program these things at the very lowest level is you go through and look at each Boolean logic function you want to implement, and you stuff it into one of these lookup tables. Now, uh, you have any function of four inputs, uh, you're good to go. You just write down the truth table and go, right? So here's a, uh, a little chunk of uh, logic from a, a, a Pong schematic uh, back in 1972. You look at it, it's a couple of NAND gates and, then, uh, and then actually another NAND gate, but drawn differently. You can mechanically go through and write down the truth table for these things, right? You know, pick all, uh, in this case, eight different combinations of L, R, and this is an uh, input M write the thing down and as mechanically as you can imagine, pick these zeros and ones out, stuff them into this lookup table, and you have this function implemented. Now, um, just doing one function of four inputs is not too exciting. Um, so what you get inside an FPGA is a, an array of these things. And even more importantly, you get programmable wiring. So these the blue blocks here uh, represent one of these things with the lookup tables. Uh, this is a switching block where you've got wires coming in from four directions. And you can tell, oh, I want to connect this one over to that one, and this one over to that one, and that one, this one over to that one, and so forth. These things are absurdly configurable. And the idea is, is that if you can envision a uh, digital logic circuit, 
consisting of Boolean logic, and you've got a flip-flop at each one of these uh, logic elements, whatever they want to be called, you can decide, oh, do I want to put a flip-flop in the output, or do I want to just uh, drive it directly through this MUX? Um, and that's what you get. And the result is, is that if it's a, a, a well-behaved circuit, so you can't do tri-states, you can't do uh, multi-vibrators, you, you shouldn't do uh, you know, feedback loops and things like that. If it's sort of well-behaved, um, you can stuff just about any circuit you want onto one of these things. And so what circuit are we going to do? We're going to do a Kim 1. There are two big players in this uh, in this space, and it's really nice. They're really sort of, you know, Canon and Nikon, if you will. Um, so it used to be uh, Altera and Xilinx. Xilinx was always a little bit ahead. Altera was playing catch up, but the two were really neck and neck, and it's really wonderful because you know they one sort of forces the other prices down a little bit, and the other one innovates a little bit more, and the other one tricks with. It, it's a it's a pretty good thing. Now, Intel bought Altera, and so the Altera name's disappearing a little bit, but that's too burned into my head, so I'm not going to be able to get rid of that name. Um, but uh, it's really a wonderful thing. Um, I happen to be an Altera guy, um, and it just happens to be, you know, the software's kind of neat. There was a problem. I had a Xilinx board, and the board sucked, and it was the problem with the FPGA. I switched over to an Altera board, and the Altera board was a bit nicer, and I've been with them ever since. But really, they're, you know, like I said, Canon and Nikon, right? You have religious arguments, but they're both just fine. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about very concretely uh, is a very old part, and I've got one here on the, on the board, an Altera Cyclone 2. They're up to like Cyclone 5 or 6s or something like that. Cyclones, uh, are they up to 10s they now? They skipped everything after 5. Ah, okay. Oh, they were concerned about, yeah, okay, so this is like Microsoft number. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> you have Blink. And it changes, and it's it's pretty unreal. Um, uh, Altera has two main lines. You're going to correct me and tell me they have three. Last time I checked, they had two. The Cyclones were the, the relatively cheap ones. The Stratix uh, were the much more expensive ones. This little guy is cheap, you know, cheap, 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 cheap all the way down. Leftover from 2004. Altera doesn't even support it anymore. It's oh, if you want to program this, you got to go get the old versions of the software or whatever. Um, the amazing thing is, you can go and buy this stuff, not quite for the price of an Arduino, but close, 16 bucks. And it's because they must have made a million of them sitting, they're sitting in a Chinese warehouse somewhere, and they think, what are we going to do with these things? Get rid of them. Um, incredibly obsolete by today's standards, but again, yeah, 16 bucks, what the heck. So, this thing only has 4,600 of these lookup tables that I'm showing of you. And you know, 4,000 some, uh, that's already getting pretty scary. Um, on high end chips these days, uh, let's see, it's, you know, like add another two zeros at least. Um, you can do a lot with these things today. Now, the one place where you always seem to run into problems uh, with FPGAs is the amount of memory you have on them. Um, so, in addition to lookup tables, you also have uh, much more traditional little RAM things, or typically you know, 4K or something like that, which you can glue them together uh, as you like. Uh, on this chip, I think it's this stripe and this stripe are, are memory. Uh, it's only 14 kilobytes. And, of course, bigger chips have more memory and so forth, but you always want a lot more memory than you want. So, a really common thing is to get a board that has this plus a you know, big SRAM or a uh, big DRAM or something like that off the chip, and then you got to worry about interfacing and all the rest. You know, there's solutions for that. Um, the Kim 1 has a whopping uh, 1K of, you know, 1K of SRAM, 2K of ROM, a little bit more or something like that. So it fits quite comfortably in this thing. Um, it has a boatload of pins by 1970 standards, 144 pins, and, you know, nothing by, by modern standards. But again, good enough. Okay, uh, this is the board, uh, like I mentioned, and it, it's kind of concerned. I, I was going to give this, uh, this lecture a couple of years ago and, and felt so could, couldn't finish it. Um, I was going to use a different board that was 30 bucks. I thought that was, you know, that was okay. Uh, and then I couldn't find, I find a way to buy it anymore. These stick around for some reason. 
So like I say, the very unfortunately named banggood.com uh, has these for 16 bucks, but if you search for them on Amazon, eBay, DX.com, AliExpress, and so forth, you'll find variants of all of these things, right? This is how the Chinese do it. Um, uh, somebody builds one of these things, and whether they sell it to a whole bunch of places, or whether somebody else gets a hold of the Gerber, Gerber files and manufacture, I don't know. The result is, is that they're all basically the same thing, all very poorly documented, you know, it's 16 bucks or whatever. But it's enough to get you going. So it's the FPGA chip, it's the star of the show, of course. On the back, you've got a 50 megahertz oscillator, it's a, a typical frequency you can run these things at. Um, this is complete overkill for the Kim, which is rather hilarious, so it runs at one. Um, you've got two programming connectors on it here. Uh, this one is for JTAG that lets you uh, zap the FPGA while it's running. Uh, this is for uh, active serial that lets you program the next thing, which is listed here, uh, which is a, a, a megabit uh, serial configuration flash. Uh, I should mention the way that these things work is that these lookup tables, which are the important bit, are SRAM cells. And so the result is, is that when you power off the FPGA, uh, it forgets everything. It forgets its identity. Um, so what you do is you connect up a serial configuration flash. You can't see it because it's on the back of the board. It's you know eight pin chip or something like that. That is set up so that when you when you power the thing on, it downloads the bit stream uh, to the chip very slowly, uh, but fast enough where it, it turns on and gets its identity back. So it's a little strange. This is to, this is um, how to perform uh, brain surgery while it's awake. This other one is, is you know, how to tell it what to do when it's being born. Uh, you know, five volt power jack. Uh, it'll, it runs at 3.3 volt I/O. Uh, the core actually runs at a terrifying 1.2 volts. Uh, you know, really huge by today's standards and so forth. And you've got the, the absolutely critical uh, three LEDs and the one push button switch. And uh, I should mention, to give you an idea, again, you know, you get what you pay for when it's 16 bucks. The switch was broken online. Uh, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, now the shipping would kill you. Uh, I should mention this actually does include shipping. It's pretty incredible. <laughs> but you can imagine the frustration. The, the problem is, is that getting something like a switch working, there's like 17 different things between you and getting a switch working. And you never think it's the stupid little switch. Anyway, so I soldered it in. On here, down my life. Uh, very important for debugging. Okay, now nobody in their right minds goes through and programs them like this, right? At, in theory, I suppose you could do it. I think there've actually been APIs where uh, you could write a program that would go in and fill these things, but nobody does that. What they do is a phone like this. So you code in something. Uh, 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 a hardware description language, and I'm going to show you about system Verilog today. Uh, VHDL is the other one. Verilog uh, is more or less the same thing, with a little slightly more annoying syntax and so forth. What you do is you write hardware for this. And in fact, um, let's see. I suppose you could use a schematic capture where you drag gates around or whatever. Uh, but you know. Real men and women, real engineers use HDL these days. It's just a lot faster and easier. You run that through a synthesis tool. In the Altera world, it's called Portis and Xilinx. Oh, I can't remember the name. They have you know separate but equal tools. This is serious CAD. This is serious commercial EDA stuff, but they give it away. And it's because they want you to use their chips and learn about that. And so this is really nice. Rather than, um, you know, if you went and bought sort of the equivalent of Cordis for doing ASICs or something like that, you know, 100,000 bucks would be a typical thing to expect for that kind of cash flow. Um, you can just download this, play with this on your, on your desktop, you know, with your $16 board and get on with your, it's really amazing stuff. Now, what Cordis does is it takes the HDL representation, compiles it, uh, internally, it goes through a netlist. It then takes that netlist, does all of the comp complicated, you know, figure out what the what the, uh, the truth tables are and the wiring and all the rest of it. It's painfully slow compared to compiling a C program on a modern machine. 
Um, but you're still talking about, for a tiny chip like this, the compilation, I'll actually do it in front of you. Um, uh, I, I teach a class where I have students do this with a slightly beefier chip. It takes like 10 or 15 minutes. And they complain bitterly of, oh, it takes me 10 or 15 minutes to do a new design. And all I can think is when I was building wire wrapping prototypes <laughs> or, or setting an ASIC thing off, but you have no idea how good you've got it. So it's not too bad. Once you've done this, you, uh, you end up with a, a big file on your, on your disk, and you can download that through the JTAG port. So that'll stuff it onto the FPGA, and suddenly the circuit you know, comes to life. And it's really a lot of fun. You can do this on your desktop. Right? You know, I, was, I was creating a new chip in the back there, you know, screwing up your presentation. And, and the, in the, in the meantime, um, it's kind of fun, right? You know, you don't burn your hands, soldering, <laughs> it's great stuff. Okay, so um, in the time I have, I'm not going to turn you into a Verilog expert, into an ACL coding expert. What I'm mostly trying to do is get the taste of this across to get, give you a sense of what's going on. Um, now, when I teach this stuff to my students, they say, oh, it looks like a programming language. <laughs> they immediately start coding in C or Java or something like that. It doesn't work. It seems like it should, but it doesn't. The syntax is suspiciously similar, and that's deliberate. Uh, but you, what you have to remember is what you're really doing is you're asking for, you're asking for logic networks. And as long as you have that model in your, in your head is when you're coding it, you've got some fighting chance. So, Verilog, um, you know, not even 101, this is like, you know, 73 or something like that. Um, give you an idea of the sorts of things you can do. So, um, text file is a full adder. It takes three bits, uh, spits out a sum and a carry as a result. And the way this is coded here, we've got two continuous assignments, which is a way of saying, give me some combinational logic for computing this stuff. And so uh, caret is XOR, uh, ampersand is AND, vertical bar is OR. And so here I'm saying the sum is the XOR of A, B, and C, and the carry is A and B, or A and C, and B or C. And the result is you run this thing through Cordis, you can actually ask it, you know, draw a schematic for it. And it does, you know, good enough. It's not as good as what a human would do. But you can usually take a look at it and see what's going on. And you know, sure enough, here's our full adder. Uh, we have a three input XOR, a little questionable what that means, but anyway, good enough. Uh, and then the three AND gates feeding an OR gate and so forth. Now, remember, all of these are fiction. There's no AND gate that you can get at directly on the FPGA. What'll happen, in fact, is it'll take this thing and from this generate the, uh, the truth table and then go and stuff that into one of the books. And it will do that again and again and again and again and again. And that's great. You don't have to deal with it, right? If this is almost understandable you know, compared to looking at ones and zeros in the, in the thing. Yeah, so that's a single bit adder. Um, <coughs> this is a single bit adder. Right. That's right. So I, will you go forward and say now I want to do four bit or something like that? Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't think I have exactly that example. Um, as is typical when you're doing sort of baby examples like this, um, uh, the way you do a four-bit adder is you write plus. <laughs> and it just takes care of it, right? The idea was that this is a, a circuit that you could you know, wrap your head around and sort of recognize and so forth. Um, there are pretty high-level things, and hope, I'm hoping we will get to that. Um, and we'll take a look at it. What I really encourage you to do is go and download the files that I posted for this thing. You can take a look and you know, see how this is actually done. Uh, do please interrupt me. I love it. Um, it reminds me that my audience is still alive, breathing, and all the rest of that stuff. Okay, um, so you can do simple combination logic. You can encapsulate this logic hierarchically in, in parallel or fault modules, you know, functions, whatever you want to call them. Um, here's a very stupid way to write an AND gate. Um, and then what you can do is you can say, well, okay, I've got one of those things. Let's plop down four of them. And then here is a phenomenally painful way to express an exclusive organ. 
<laughs> now, the neat thing is, because all of this gets distilled down into lookup tables, and it's, it would, in fact, it would take all of this junk, make it go away, and put it into one lookup table. Um, and in fact, probably pack more things into one lookup table as well. So, in fact, as stupid as this is, if you ask for it, you're not going to get a really inefficient circuit. It, it'll end up being fine. Uh, you just it will have typed a lot more than you need to. Right? If you want an XOR, you write this. And most of the time, you don't want an XOR, you want a lot more. And there's fancier stuff for that. Is, is, this, is it pretty smart where it distills it down, like you use where it distills it down, yeah. to the most efficient use, or is it easy for you to code it wrong and really waste a lot uh, of data? The answer is yes and no. So there's been an enormous amount of work put in to logic synthesis algorithms to go from the problem of you know, arbitrary, nonsensical netlists down to a reasonably compact implementation for it. And the kind of tricks it's able to play where it can move things forward and back and group things and ungroup them, and look for that. pretty darn remarkable. That said, um, it's actually pretty easy to write really broken Verilog that will generate a circuit that you don't want. And uh, I don't want, I mean, wickedly more inefficient than you want. Um, it turns out um, the, the biggest mistake my students make is not understanding that a, a memory block can only be accessed once per cycle. Now, you can build multi-port memories, but you can't build 100 multi-port, you can't build 100 port memories very efficiently. It turns into you know, multiplexers and AND gates and just, and the answer is you don't want that. So. Um, it's a bit like when you're coding in C, right? You can write stuff in C and have reasonable faith that it'll turn into reasonable software. Um, but you could write really, really inefficient stuff, and the C compiler is just going to, well, it'll do something, but it, it's just kind of stupid. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's not to the point where you're going to sort of worry about, oh, geez, did I do that? Am I using this many AND gates or what have you? Because that does disappear and sort of go away. But there's still plenty of mistakes you can do. And by mistakes, I mean efficiency-related mistakes. Of course, there's the getting the function wrong, which is a much more popular problem. Okay, um, so to give you an idea of how you can sort of step up in levels of abstraction, right? This is a, uh, the kind of thing you get in a, a digital logic one of one class is, you know, oh, you know, how do you do a decimal and seven segment decoder? Right, you write down the Boolean logic, you, you throw it into a Carnot map, you optimize it, you try to come up with it. Uh, and in this world, you write down the truth table uh, using a case statement, very much like a C, uh, C program, and it takes care of the rest. So doing things like state assignments or optimization using Carnot maps and trying to, all of that stuff is just not necessary at all at this level. Uh, and the result is with this with this thing, um, it would probably just turn into uh, seven lookup tables, uh, and that's seven out of four thousand on the on this cheap chip. And so you, you just throw it down, and you get on with your life. It works just fine. Uh, uh, I should mention a little bit of the notation here. Uh, this is Verilog esque for I want four binary digits. I'm going to tell you what it is in decimal, so eight. One zero zero will come through. This is seven binary digits, and the underscores to help you keep track and so forth. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. So up at the top input logic, three colon zero. Right. That's saying three bits. Um, so it's saying four bits. So what this is? Uh, this is a vector. Uh, so A is a vector of four bits, numbers zero, one, two, and three. Ah. Uh, okay. And similarly, the output here is seven output bits. And so what I'm doing is I'm, here I'm just saying, okay, let's look at A, which is in fact a vector. And, you know, oh, it's four bits, and so I'm reminding it it's four bits. This might be redundant, but it's always nice to keep in mind how many bits there actually are. You get errors from the compiler warning you, oh, you're putting a square peg in a, an enormous hole in a plane and so forth. And so similarly here, we've got seven bits coming out. So if I were to throw into this function, what do you call one of these? Oh, yeah, they call it module. You, you, you speak of module instances. So if my input to that module was A, yeah. one or one, I would get zero. Uh, Anything yeah. that was beyond nine. 
Um, well, so that's interesting. So anything that's, oh, yeah, um, anything that's beyond 9, it would turn off all of the segments, assuming it's, uh, it's turned on. I think I got the encoding here right. Um, you, can also, you can also put in X's here, meaning, I don't care. You know, do what you want. And often that will give you a simpler uh, uh, circuit. If you're actually building out of gates on an ASIC, that would be the way to go. On an FPGA, you know, incompletely specified logic versus completely specified logic it doesn't matter because all you have are look lookup tables. Everything's completely specified. So yeah, the things you have to play with are signal bits and bit vectors. And you can do sort of simple manipulation, but you can also do arithmetic on bit vectors. And that actually gets you pretty darn close to most stuff. Um, okay. Oh, did I? Ah, yes. So we're getting here, right? The case statement starts to smell more and more kind of software programming like. Um, you can even use if then else statements. So here is sort of the beginnings of a really strange ALU. Uh, the idea here is we've got four bits coming in, um, four bits going out, uh, or excuse me, two pairs of four bits coming in. We've got a select line coming in called S. And what we're saying, oh, if S is true, I want Y to be A plus B, otherwise it's going to be A and B. And what you can see here is what it built was, here's the two four-bit vectors coming in. It gets fed both to four AND gates to implement this, plus a four-bit adder understands what a four-bit adder is and, and implements it um, actually in a very clever way. And then it has uh, puts multiplexers on the output to choose which of these two. That's what the effect of the if and else is. And so it's actually it's pretty nice. You can think in terms of, oh, do this, otherwise do that. And it goes and turns it into multiplexers, which in turn get boiled down into AND gates and simplified away. So here's getting even more fancy. And this is beginning to smell a little bit more like what you might find in a processor. Um, an address decoder, we've got an address coming in, we've got a bunch of one-hot um, uh, select lines going out for RAM, ROM, and video. And so what you can do is you can say, okay, well, by default, I want all those things to be zero, but if the most significant bit is set, I want ROM, ROM to be set, but if the address, uh, you know, bits 14 and 13 are both zero, then that's the video re region, you know, I just made this up, obviously. But this is the kind of stuff you can you can do. You know, rather than having to think about it this way and then figuring out, oh, I need these AND gates and these exclusive OR gates and all the rest of that, it's a lot easier just to write this stuff down and let it figure it out. Okay, this has all been combinational logic. Um, it's nice to have some state occasionally. And so the way you do this is always flip flop and then you say, oh, at the pause edge clock, go take D and copy it to Q. This is exactly the classical D flip-flop, where you hit this thing with a rising edge of the clock, it takes the contents of the, of the D input, moves it over to the Q input, and then it holds until the next clock. And so, you know, really simple. The way this gets implemented, if you remember uh, from the second slide, you've got this lookup table, and it feeds a multiplexer and a flip-flop. And then the multiplexer chooses, oh, do I take the output of the lookup table directly from that, or do I take it out uh, from the flip-flop? So it's funny. These flip-flops are essentially free. They're there. Every, every lookup table has a, a flip-flop connected with it. And so this is how you ask, oh, in a vital way, let's, uh, let's register that, that signal. Is there any advantage in the way or any reason to say, if Q hasn't changed, do this? Uh, let's see. Absolutely not, because the way you build flip flops is you don't want to gate the clock. There's a global clock going around. Oh, uh, right, right. Using it that way. Yeah. And so I should mention things like RS latches built from you know two uh, NAND gates connected back to back in, in a loop are not a good idea on, on an FPGA. Uh, generally, you want all the combinational logic to be acyclic, and you want one clock connecting them all. You can, you know, if you're really crazy, you can. Uh, come up with exceptions to this, but my advice is don't be crazy. So when you're building a Kim one, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. 
This is going to run a 50 megahertz. Is this actually a 50 megahertz? Or you can do something at the bottom of the clock. Um, I could run it at 50 megahertz. That would be kind of interesting. A hyperactive 60 by 2 would that probably work? Uh, I slowed it down. I'll get to that. Okay. Here's how to build a 4 bit binary counter. We're almost done with the, the, the tutorial here. And so here, rather than just saying, oh, take D and turn it into Q, you can actually say, oh, take count, add 1 to it. And then that's going to be the new count. And what it builds is this. You've got actually four flip-flops here. This is a bus. And it feeds around and actually feeds in a, uh, uh, a one here. And why it traversed the bits, I don't know. But the result is that every time you move this thing with the clock, yes, it, it adds one. And this, of course, is absurd feeding a constant into an adder. Again, it doesn't actually build that. It goes and figures, oh, wait, constant adder. I know that one. Comes to a more appropriate circuit for that. But, okay, uh, Quartus. Um, they're up to uh, version 18 or something like that. Uh, they stopped supporting the Cyclone 2 family uh, uh, version 13, and so you go and download that one. And what you get is a reasonably tolerable GUI. They've been playing with this and trying to improve this. Uh, year after year, and it's a GUI where I'm almost willing to go and use it. Um, I'm a big fan of command line tools, but you, you get the idea. You've got the notion of a project, which is a collection of files. Here's the list of files that it has. Um, here's one of these files, the beginnings of a uh, system Verilog file. Uh, you've got a bunch of tasks that you can tell it to do. Um, you've got things like netlist viewers and so forth and all the rest of it. And you know, to me, uh, all of these buttons do something. I don't know what most of them do. Um, and they never do quite what you expect a second. Anyway, um, but it'll work. If you you're, if you insisted using the GUI, it's there. But fortunately, they all have command line stuff as well. OK, um, I will mention, um, if you want to install this on uh, Ubuntu 64-bit, uh, uh, this is old enough where they only released, well, let's see, they re released a hybrid 32 and 64 bit, uh, but the installer is 32 bit, so you've got to figure out how to do that on a, any kind of modern machine. Anyway, there's a trick with installing the right libraries, and you've got to give, give it the right path, and you've got to tell it, oh, please run 64 bit mode because this only loaded half the libraries. You need usual stuff. I mention this mostly because you know, if you actually want to do this, uh, it's good to know the magic incantations. Um, but it's not in the butt of one. Even more magic incantations. Um, uh, there's an issue. So the way it works is that if you want to speak to hardware, you've got to go through a dongle. And it doesn't matter what hardware, and it doesn't matter what dongle. Anyway, this is the this is the dongle in question. And every dongle I know of is USB on one side and some weirdo collection of pins on the other. And you know, this is just what you need to do. And so this is what you need to program. Altera ones, of course, there's a Xilinx one, an AVR one. I have a drawer in my uh, office. There's just more dongles. It's just filled. Uh, one trick is you've got to tell it so that when this thing gets plugged in, that it's you're allowed to go and access it. Otherwise, you get, oh, I can't get at it, uh, security things or whatever. And the magic incantation for that is to put a put something in the UDEV rules that tell it, oh, if you if you see USB uh, 09FB6001, that's this silly little thing, um, uh, make it so that everybody can play with it in your own way. It's one of these things where you can bash your head around for hours, or you can be lucky and Google and find just the right thing, type it in and it works. So yeah, I, I'm just going to mention one other thing for this too is that there's this modem manager thing that's still floating around on a lot of the distributions, and it will foul up this in these weird ways. Mm -hmm. I don't remember it off the top of my head, but there's a way to add to that rules line to tell it explicitly disable the modem manager for this device, and that fixes a lot of pain. Oh, interesting. Okay, this is modem manager under under uh, various Linux. Yeah. Huh, okay. Yeah. Fortunately, I've not run into that particular problem, but uh, yeah. Um, and Google, as usual, is your friend. Uh, oh, I should mention, uh, let's see, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when they used to uh, advertise uh, cigarettes all over the place. I remember just before that ended, uh, it was just a cigarette ad, uh, billboard actually, 
and they, they sort of figured they were losing and all the rest of it. They said, you know, if you smoke, uh, smoke camels or whatever it was. Because so they, they knew they were killing and they were losing all the rest of it. But, you know, assuming you're already addicted, you know, buy our product was kind of what they were saying. And so similarly, um, all of this stuff is available for Windows as well. So, you know, if you smoke and use Windows, you can use the software as well. I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise it. <laughs> but you won't have to go through all this thing. Um, no. Well, you've, got a, you've got a different, you've got a whole different set of, of, of things to work on. But this one. This, this, this will work, yeah. And the, the actual reason this doesn't, you don't have to do this anymore uh, for the recent editions because they finally realized, gosh, people are using Ubuntu, maybe we ought to make sure that it works with that and not just, uh, not just Red Hat. Um, but uh, anyway, so this particular this particular problem has been solved in the later ones and been replaced by others. But you know how it goes. Okay. Anybody use this with Windows running on Linux VM? Works fine in VMware as long as you can pass the USB through. Okay. Yeah. Works on Mac too with with VM. With yeah, with VM. Yeah. Yeah. You could, it, basically, as long as you can get through the USB stuff, you're probably okay. And that that's a big if, but uh, yeah, it can be done. That's, that's a good point. I, um, yeah, we'll see. I try not to do VMs either because they tend not to they tend not to work. But uh, anyway. yeah. But, so um, you're saying if you use a later Ubuntu, no, if this you, goes away. If you use later, if you use a later Terras, of course. Yeah. Okay. If you use the later Altera stuff. And this with this particular board. Right. Right. Exactly. Board like I say, this this board, this this the Cyclone Two family is so old. Right. Altera is not interested in selling them anymore or supporting them. It's kind of like, eh, you want to use this sure. stuff, fine. Go, okay. you know, go download this other junk. We don't really care. We're more interested in making money from the very, very high end stuff that goes into Cisco routers. Is kind of, kind of the attitude. Sure. Okay. So um, let's talk about Hello World for FPGA. Um, right. This is the thing that you write first to kick. Uh, your development system and uh, make it so it can actually work something. Um, what you actually need are four files. Um, Cordis is nice, but it likes to make a mess. Um, just compiling Hello World generates, I think it's on, like, on the order of 50 or 60 files. And yeah, I don't know why it does that. Maybe they're in the cahoots with the, the people who make the drives. Um, you actually only need four things. Um, you need a project file, and it's really funny, if you look at the project file, it's mostly just saying, this is a project file named hello. There's not much in there. Most of the action is actually in this, this so-called settings file, and what it has is it set, tells you what kind of device, what kind of, what kind of chip you're going to program. Um, and most importantly, when you talk about a name in the Verilog, what physical pin it ends up on. And so that's, that's kind of the big challenge. Um, now, you can't, for technical reasons, put, that, put the same information here, but another thing you want to do is check the timing. Cordis comes with a good static timing analyzer where you say, okay, I want this sucker to run at 50 megahertz, will it? And it'll go through and analyze and look up the timing models for the details and do the, all the analysis, um, but you've got to tell it what the clock is and where it is. And for reasons, uh, this has to be in a separate file. Uh, and then finally, you actually have the program itself, the, the specification of the guts. Once you've got all of that, you can either you know, do the GUI thing if you must, um, or invoke Cordis from the command line, remind it's using a 64 bit machine, tell it to use the compile flow, which is basically do all the important stuff, and tell it the name of the project. And it will do that. Once that's done, it's created a file, uh, uh, SOF or POF. POF is the file that you download to the flash. And the way you do that is through this uh, Cordis program uh, uh, command. And it goes out and talks to the dongle and figures out that the dongle is connected properly and all the rest of that. And if all goes well, it, it downloads the new uh, uh, bitstream into the flash. And so the next time you turn the chip on, it'll come up. Demonstrate some of these. So um, these are slightly abbreviated versions. Uh, 
here's the project file, and the main thing is the project version is hello. Um, the settings file is a lot of noise, but it has things like uh, the chip and the family and some stuff about what it was created for, and you know, tell it what temperature it might run at. Um, but here's the important stuff. Telling it for uh, which pins, these are physical things, connecting up to what logical things in the barrel are. Um, and as you, one of the neat things is all of these IOs are sort of wickedly programmable. Each of these, each of the pins on this thing could be a simple thing, it could be part of a differential input, a, you know, low power, you can adjust the skew rate as we pull ups, you can put on all of them. All of those uh, tricks are not something you talk about in the parallel, you specify through the settings model. Um, and then the, uh, the, the uh, constraints file here, mostly it's just, Clock 50 is a 50 megahertz clock, and then there's some other nonsense you got to put in. Um, here is the little hello program that I wrote, and pretty straightforward. It's got the 50 megahertz clock input. Uh, it's got the the key for the, the broken key switch. It took me, like I say, it took me a long time to figure that out, and then it has the three LEDs coming out. And what this does is. It just pop down a 27-bit counter, Y27, yeah, it kind of works with 50 megahertz and makes it not flash too much. And then just, oh, every time you hit a clock edge, either add one um, or four if the key is pressed. And then, oh, by the way, the LEDs are active low, so if you put a zero on one of these LED pins, it actually lights the LED. So to make it count up and set it down visibly, So, I am going to be wickedly daring and attempt to do that right here. Okay, so we're going to go to the Hello Project here. And we're down to the very minimum the project file, the settings file, and so forth. Now, um, I always like creating main files that actually run all of this stuff so I don't have to remember how to run it. Uh, let's see here. So, I'm going to tell it to make a program flash here. And so, we are now running Cordis. And it is a very verbose uh, thing, and it generates way too many info things. A handful of warnings are actually worthwhile. This is a, this is a problem with CAD tools. They tend to uh, warn like crazy. Um, and three of those warnings are really important. The rest are noise, and you better go and fix those three. Anyway, in the time that I did that, it managed to compile it and managed to download it and run it on this board. Now, it won't run while it's still in programming mode. But now, I will disconnect it, and you will see, at least the people in the front row will see, uh, we've got some LEDs counting binary, and when I press my uh, replacement switch here, it goes a little faster. So, uh, amazing amount of work to get to that point. <laughs> but if you've, if you've ever sort of you know, brought up hardware for the first time or something like that, there is nothing better than seeing the lights blink for the first time. That is just the most awesome thing. Okay, I promised you Kim, let's talk about Kim. So, MOS Technology 1976, there's one of them, uh, there's a beautiful one sitting in the, the BCF Museum, we'll take a look at it later, and it wouldn't let me take it out and show it to you, so you've got to go take a look at it. Um, one megahertz 6502 processor, I cut my teeth on the 6502, I still remember the opcodes, it's really, really sad. It's got a couple of uh, GPIO chips, and these things are weird. It's got ROM, uh, 64 bytes of RAM in it. Uh, and GPIO, which is the most important thing, plus a timer, which uh, isn't used uh, in this thing. Here is one kilobyte of static RAM and eight chips. Uh, we will emulate that with five lines of Verilog. Uh, we've got a hexadecimal keyboard here, uh, six, seven, L seven LEDs, a software-operated serial port with, on the original Kim, a uh, current loop um, so that you can connect it up to your ASR33. Nice stuff. 
It also has a cassette interface, and I did not emulate that because I didn't want to torture myself or you. Now, um, you mentioned earlier in the last talk that one of the great things about uh, vintage computers is that things are well documented, and the Kim is no exception. Uh, at the time, uh, Moss put out some really nice manuals for them. They're scanned, they're beautiful, they're very easily available, awesome stuff. Basically, it's pick this thing up and start typing. So, here's the block diagram, and so this tells us what we gotta do. I wanna put a Kim on one of these FPGAs. 6502 processor, two of these 6530 Riot uh, things, which really are a Riot. We've got the, the one kilobyte of memory, uh, TTY audio tape, and the way the TTY interface is just an electrical thing, what it's really doing is it's just picking, uh, it's just using a couple of pins off of 6530. It's completely software, and it's, so it's a little flaky, but it, you know, it's enough to work. Uh, then we've got the keyboard and display. So what are we going to do for all of these? Well, the 6502 here is the most complicated thing. And fortunately, there are um, literally hundreds of people on the planet who are crazy enough for entertainment to go and code in VHDL or Paralog a 6502 core. Um, so we're just going to steal that one. Um, the 1K RAM, like I say, it's about five lines, and I'll show you how to code that. It's pretty straightforward. The 6530, we're going to have to do it ourselves. But fortunately, it's actually pretty straightforward, and again, reasonably well documented. You can find data sheets, plus looking at what the software does and the rest of it. Um, now, I.O. stuff. Uh, originally, I was actually thinking to hook up a VGA display and a PS2 port on or something like that and make it so that a PS2 keyboard would look like the original keyboard to this and the, an LED, uh, a VGA display would look like the LEDs. But no, I decided to do point-to-point -point wiring instead because I'm a masochist. Um, so I'm actually going to build those. Uh, the teletype, of course, is where all the action is because we want to use that, so we're going to emulate that so forth. And the audio stuff, um, uh, I think you know it was the last session where somebody was talking about cassettes and how to make those work and all the rest of it. I missed that session, so I'm not going to do the audio. Mm -hmm. Okay. To actually get a Verilog, a working Verilog model of even a 6502, which is a pretty darn simple processor by today's standards, this is not a trivial thing. This is not an afternoon. This is this is quite a lot of work. And so the way to do this is to steal somebody else's work. And um, I found four others written in Verilog, and there's others written in VHDL, and, and so forth and so on. And, you know, like all free software, you sort of get what you pay for. And so there's very varying levels of quality. With each of these, I sort of looked at it, you know, how much of a mess are they? You know, what's the interface like? How complete is it? Do I believe that it actually works? Uh, I chose the second one because it's pretty simple. It was designed for FPGAs. Uh, this Open Cores one uh, is a little too fancy for my taste. It was simulating that uh, the 6502 actually uses this crazy two phase clock internally, and yeah, I don't want to bother with that. So I just picked this up, looked at it, and said, Yeah, that looks reasonable. Made sure it compiled. And here's how you emulate that Sitting off is the definition of the MCS 6502 uh, module. And all you say is, I'm going to call that instance U1, and I'm going to connect the clock to the clock, the reset to reset, the address bus, the address bus, data in, data out, write enable. Um, uh, we're not going to do any IRQs for this. The Kim had poor support for interrupts. Uh, it did have support for NMI, and it does have a ready signal as well. And so <coughs> I'm writing a module that talks about the Kim 1 board. And so I'm going to model those things as well, we just have inputs and outputs, so in fact the address bus was visible on the outside of the pit one, so we want that. So that's pretty good. That's actually good enough where all you have to say is, yeah, give me one of those. And if you've ever you know, wire wrapped or done point-to-point -point wiring or whatever, <laughs> typing this <laughs> instead of wire wrapping 16 individual pins is a lot nicer. A lot less error prone too. Okay, in the Kim One user manual are schematics, kind of. They're kind of fragmentary. It's a little annoying that they're all, but it's good enough. So um, here is the processor. 
and some of the I.O. stuff. So, um, here's the crystal and some other nonsense around it and some other things going to the expansion factor. We mostly have to worry about this. Um, we're going to derive a 1 megahertz uh, frequency from the 50 megahertz, and that's an interesting story, but it's basically just don't do stuff most of the time. Um, there's, uh, let's see, uh, step and reset signals. I'm sorry, stop and reset signals, and they had a little bouncer circuit on here. Um, the uh, buttons that I pulled out of my junk box uh, seemed to be good enough, and I figured if worse comes to worse, I will build a hardware to bouncer on the FPGA. And so I just hooked those up directly and hoped for the best and seemed to work fine. Um, um, this is kind of interesting. This is a single step switch, and this was a little disappointing. It would be really nice to be able to single step the thing. Uh, the problem is, is that it requires input from the sync signal that comes out of the, uh, the 6502, which that core doesn't have some direct support from. <coughs> it didn't, I ran out of time to try to uh, hack that in. It would be interesting. Um, and here it is, the Kim's address decoder. It is a 74LS145 chip that takes three address bits in and spits uh, out a one hot, um, you know, hey you, wake up code. This is nice to code in parallel. Um, and here I did that. So I said, okay, 74145, we've got four bit select input, um, actually 10 bit output gets used in different ways, and you just write this down. And there's different ways to write it, and it just works. It's good enough. And then here I am asking for it. Um, there's actually an 8-bit K. The reason I use K is that this is the first kilobyte of memory, the second kilobyte of memory, and so forth. And they only bothered to decode the first 8 bytes because they couldn't imagine anybody putting more than 8, eight kilobytes of memory into this thing. Okay. Uh, the clock. Now, the clock is interesting, right? There are no crystal oscillators inside FPGAs. Uh, the way you put clocks on is you, you bring them in through typically dedicated clock pins, and sure enough, this board has an off board 50 megahertz oscillator connecting on it. Um, the FPGAs also have very fancy programmable phase lock loops that let you synthesize a wide range of frequencies. And so I started playing with that and discovered that that wide range of frequencies um, started at about 10 megahertz and then went up from there. So, the result is, to make this thing run slow enough, is I just synthesize the clock. I put a divide by 50 counter in here. What this is doing is it's counting uh, 0 up to 24, and then toggling the clock, and then counting up to 0 to, to, I'm sorry, to, 20, to, 0 to 24, and toggling it again. And uh, during debugging, what I did is I took this, took this output, stuffed it onto a pin, put my scope on it, measured the, measured the frequency, and yep, sure enough, dead on. 0.00 megahertz. So, yeah, it works, it works out. Generally, this kind of stuff is kind of questionable, but if you're going to divide by an integer, yeah, why not? Because it works. Could, could you have used a phase loop to, is it called phase loop? Phase lock loop, PLL. Phase lock, yeah, PLL. Could you use the PLL to uh, get down to 10 and divide by 10? I could have, but I see no pretty good reason to have done that. So. Oh. It's red and fussing with two things. Is that, is that building another set of logic? And then um, now, the way you ask for the phase lock loops is you have to go through the GUI and press a whole bunch of things and choose some numbers, and then that gives you something if you plop down and all the rest of it. So it ends up being actually a lot more fancy, a lot more fussy than that. The advantage of using the phase lock loop is you can do fancier things like um, you know, adjust skew on things. You can do fractional things because it will both multiply and divide. I mean, it's, it, there's a bunch of fancy stuff on it, but running at slow frequencies is not one of the fancy things that they bother with. Um, I think that's actually more an idiosyncrasy of the cyclone too than anything else. But anyway. Okay. Um, like I say, uh, 8 kilobytes of RAM, uh, excuse me, 1 kilobyte of RAM. Here's how you ask for 1 kilobyte of RAM. You say, give me an array of 1024 8-bit vectors. Just says okay, and you then plot something down here, and then this is the behavior of the RAM. Oh, if K0 is selected, it's active low. Then take a look at write enable, and if we're writing stuff data into the memory from 
data out from the processor. Otherwise, take the data from the RAM, send it to the processor, and oh, by the way, I created these fake output enable signals. Now, the original Kim, as most things of this age, uh, just used a tri-state bus where you turn on things off and on. FPGAs don't have on-chip uh, tri-state buses, so I just emulated one. I said, okay, if the RAM is talking, then the data going to the processor comes from the RAM. If the, the small RAM is talking, the, other, the ROM is talking, and so forth. And in fact, this is sort of the standard on FPGAs to do it. Seems really wasteful, but yeah, it works. Okay, uh, the riot was a riot. So if you look at the documentation on these things, um, it has actually a fair amount of mass programming wrong. Part of it is for sort of programs and so forth, and that's easy enough, that's dumped. Um, but part of it also is the chip select is mass wrong programmable. And so that was sort of a pain in the butt, so I had to sort of fake that somehow. What's going on inside this is mostly two general purpose I.O. 8-bit buses. And the way that works is you've got, um, you've got uh, data direction registers so you can put each pin, either as an input or an output, plus you've got an output register and so forth. What's neat is that whole, most of that chip, I didn't do the timer, but this is the I.O. stuff, ends up doing that way. And so what is this? It's, oh, when my chip's been selected, take a look at read-write, and then the address, that'll tell you which register you're reading or writing. And so here we are. Um, when you write to address zero, that means data from the processor, I'm gonna to put to uh, uh, the peripheral uh, port A out. Whereas here, if I'm reading from that, I will take a look at what's coming in on those pins and display it. And send it back. Okay, this ended up being the most challenging thing, because I actually built it. This is a display. So we've got uh, common anode display, uh, common anode LEDs, we've got uh, PNP transistors uh, driving them, because 145 doesn't have the power. Um, then we've got rows and columns multiplexed between the, both the keyboard and the display. Kind of a pain in the butt. Um, now, what I figured is, eh, I'm not going to do the 74145 because that's exactly the sort of thing that FPGAs would have. These inverters, yeah, I can fake those two. That may have been a questionable thing. I'm not sure if I've got the current drive. You've got to put the transistors in because those are electrical, not logical things. So uh, what I did is started using a lot of pins. So I've got something that selects one of the digits. And here I numbered them funny. To make them consistent here, this was 987654. And that's how they thought of it. Then we have uh, row outputs that let you scan the, the matrix keypad here. Um, then we have LED, LED segment drivers. Um, and then column inputs for reading the, the thing. And so what I did. Uh, this is fun. So this came out of my junk box. I found this back in probably about 1989 and been sitting in my junk box. Uh, new old stock from that, the vector board for the, for the back. And um, you know, all of this, I just I ripped out of various things that I found and discovered how much I hate point-to-point -point wiring. It's took far too much time. Um, but here it is. We've got the FPGA board, a ribbon cable that I uh, repurposed, connected up. And you know, here's power ground, and uh, let's see, this is the uh, drive for the, the LED uh, digits, segments, and so forth and so on. And the, the weirdo, this should be a nice, uh, simple uh, row and column thing, but if you look at the way the keyboard is laid out versus how it's wired, the two are just completely random. So, you know, the, the, hence, hence the screen. <coughs> Uh, let's see, nearly at the end here, I will mention, to put to take care of these constraints, to tell it what files you have, where the, all the pins are, which of them have uh, uh, internal resistant pull-ups, all the rest of that, you can go in and sort of manually do it one at a time with the GUI, and I think that's kind of the intention. Um, but, you know, me, given the opportunity, I'd rather write a program. And so Cordis is highly scriptable. It uses this tickle language. 
language. That's pretty standard in, in EDA tools. And the result is that you can write a program like this. Uh, it's quite a bit longer than this. But you can simplify things where, here's the pinout. So uh, LED digit 4 goes to pin 65. And incidentally, of course I screwed up the segments of the LED wiring the first time. Right? You know, how can you not? And the great thing is, I didn't have to use the soldering. I just had to fix this program to you know, configure the pins a little bit differently. It worked. Now, figuring out which permutation of the things, that was more interesting. Uh, but anyway. Um, and then finally, um, what I tried to do was the 6502 core knows nothing about its existence in a Kim. I have a module around that, which is all about Kim and has nothing to do with uh, the board that we're using, uh, or the chip that we're using, the board that we're using. This is the module that's specific to the, the chip and the board. And so there's tricks like um, the, the way the keyboard row works, it needs to be an open collector output, and you can fake that uh, by using this tri-state output with a little bit of logic. You know, oh, if you want if you're driving a zero, drive a zero. If you want to drive a one, in fact, no, you put it into IZ mode and you disconnect it. And the keyboard worked the first time. I was pretty pleased with that. Anyway, so you run this thing, and it will tell you, hey, here's what worked. And so this is the, the, the summary of the fitter. This is the thing that figures out where to put everything in the white routes, the wires, and all the rest of that. And so here we go. Here's the name of the, the device. Total logic elements. We only use 600 lookup tables out of the 4,000, so a whopping 13%. So the 6502 is small. Kim is simple. It fits with no effort whatsoever. Um, I was expecting this to be more like 50% or something like that. It's just, it's just not that bad. All right, 259 registers, you can probably go in and figure out what all those were, although a lot of them are sort of you know, counters in various places. Used a reasonable chunk of pins, not too memory, not too much. Total memory bits, oh, I used a quarter of them. And uh, I was thinking actually of cranking this up and turning this from a super Kim running with you know, 8K of memory. Something like that. Quite get um, there's also uh, there were two PLLs, and you can use either of them. There's uh, multipliers, and you can use any of those. There's two things and multipliers, and so forth. So um, uh, I'm going to conclude. Uh, I'm out of time here. I will show you. That I'll run the demo that you guys can run off the lunch uh, as you like. I will mention I'm not the only nut who does this sort of thing. One I've known about for a long time is this place called FPGA Arcade that really got me fired up. Uh, they had uh, Space Invaders and Pac-Man and so forth reproduced basically this way. You know, they started with, a, in the case of uh, Pac-Man, a Z80 core, and then built the video logic up around it. Um, and they also have things like the Mega cores and Commodore 64 cores and so forth that they built. Um, this guy even uses the same board and has figured out how to do video with it, connect up an SD card to it. And it's, it there's crazy stuff you can do. Here's another one that takes a stock FPGA board, adds a bunch of connectors to it, and, and also does uh, retro computing. So it's kind of neat stuff, and it's you know, it's still not easy, right? It, it, it's not so short. On the other hand, the stuff you can do with it once you get going, that's pretty darn awesome. Yeah. The neat part about the multi-comp is that you can load different cores in. I don't know if you mentioned that or not. Uh, you can load cores in and have like a Z80 or a 6502 whatever. Oh, yeah. Well, um, that's kind of the whole point, right? Today this thing's a Kim. Tomorrow it can be the, uh, the stupid light flasher again. Um, and, yeah, so you can flip between them. But they're cheap enough where, hey, you may as well just use one. Yeah? So how do you troubleshoot your code? Uh, it takes me 10, 20, 50 times to get the code work right, because I'm always doing something wrong. Do you use the JTAG? Can you step through the modules? Or? There are a variety of ways to do debugging. And, yeah, it's challenging. Um, the, what's interesting is I find that de debugging, a lot of it you can do like I do software debugging. How do I do software debugging? Well, we'll at time. No, no, print statements. Okay. You, know, you just put a print statement in. What's a print statement in Vero? An LED. Light the LED. <laughs> and literally, you know, you can do that. Now, they've got a really fancy thing where you can actually tell it to compile a logic analyzer on the chip. And yeah. <laughs> let it look for things and all the rest of that. But I don't know, my, my experience is that when I'm debugging something, I want the simplest thing that I can trust. 
right? There's, when, it, when there's a bug, it's because there's a mismatch between what I understand and what's actually going on. And the way to solve that is not to bring in something even more complicated than I understand, even less, to try to figure it out. So, um, for example, when I was trying to figure out what was going on with the, the serial port, it took me a while to get that working. Um, it was connect the LED, connect uh, up the LED to the outside. Now, if you would do this, you know, if you were building, you know, a physical uh, thing or whatever, you, you do with a logic analyzer or a scope or something like that, or you connect with LED directly or whatever, you can do that. Um, but I guess fancier than that, the other thing you can do is you can run uh, software simulations. And in fact, I left some code in there where you can run, uh, there's a great Verilog compiled code simulator called Verilayer that's nearly as fast as a commercial thing. And you can tell this thing to go and start executing instructions. And I did that at one point and realized, oh, yeah, I mapped the memory in the wrong place. No wonder it's not happening. So uh, certainly, um, I've lost count of the number of times I compiled this thing. Uh, and, you know, only the last one actually worked. But eh, there are techniques. Yeah. Uh, uh, early in your talk, uh, just beginning to describe combinatorial logic, the first thing that came to my mind is how does he deal with propagation? My general impression is, is that the internal clocking of this thing is, is much faster than your external operations, so that uh, it's not a big issue unless you're working on the Are you talking a bit about that? Um, so, compared to ASICs or custom things, FPGAs are maybe one tenth the speed, and so the propagation delay is actually pretty bad. Um, what happens is, so, you know. A little RAM is a slow way to compute a function, uh, but that's not what kills you. What kills you is the delay through the wiring, um, because every one of these things is actually past transistors and so forth. And so, yes, um, compared to you know three gigahertz, you know i7 core or whatever, this thing is dog slow. Um, now that said, it's not too bad. You could run the cores. You know, 50 megahertz is actually kind of modest. You could probably run this thing up at 100 if you really worked at it, depending on the circuitry that you put in. Your comment about the external stuff and how fast the pins go, absolutely, like any chip design, you can only, you usually run the core a lot faster than you can run the pins. Um, at one megahertz, <laughs> who cares, right? You know, we're, we're dealing with 30-year-old uh, clock frequencies and let, let these things in the dust. I didn't even bother uh, looking to see whether this thing meant timing. I didn't tell it a timing constraint, but it's kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, worst case slack, you know, 100 nanoseconds or 200 nanoseconds, you know, just, just insane numbers. So just to follow up on that, yeah. so from the external world, I'm feeding in the program how? From the keyboard or am I able to run the program in some way or what? So which program do you mean? <clears throat> oh, okay. So there's, there's uh, a 6502 program. Ah, okay. So at that point, it's where um, uh, I should flip over and do a little more demo. If you guys want to run to lunch, I'm, I don't know how many minutes I'm over at this point, but uh, I won't feel offended. Um, let me bring the Kim back into existence. The moment this is a very expensive counter. So I just told it to reflash it with the Kim stuff. And there it goes. So now I'm going to disconnect the programming Turn off the serial port jumper. Pull this thing up so you can see it. And with luck, when I press reset, looky there. So this is actually, it's doing an address and data at that. And then you can press plus and it'll go up uh, uh, an address at a time. And you can tell it, uh, you know, put in data, you know, DE plus you know, uh, AD plus and so forth. And now it Set it, tell it to go to uh, <coughs> zero, zero, zero. Turn to one or something like that. And then ask it to look. The data should be there. Oh, come on. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So that's good. So there it is. I just downloaded the configuration for him uh, onto the little flash chip. Now, if you actually want to program this sucker, going to uh, emulate the heck out of a, uh, a teletype, and 
and we're going to do that through another USB dongle. This is uh, uh, one of these USB serial things, and it's perfect. It uses 3.3 volt I/O, so I don't have to do any level shifting or, or anything like that. So the result is pops up as USB zero, and we're going to run it at a whopping 300 watts. It'll go a little bit faster, um, but it's a software serial port, so it's banging every, every little thing. Um, and it's using a software timing loop, and God only knows. And when we want to load a paper tape, which we will here in a second, um, it didn't want to go very fast. So the way this thing works is we'll press reset, press return, and there it comes to life. And so um, this is the Kim One monitor. This is the Kim. This is the Kim One monitor. And so it came up displaying zero zero e if I see it, zero three or something like that. Press uh, press space. It'll tell me what's there. And then we can step through it one thing at a time. Let's see what the no, I guess it's returned as the next address. Right. So here we're dumping memory. Pretty exciting. <laughs> Sure. It seems like I'm getting some glitches, which is kind of interesting. I don't know what's going on there. Okay, and there's DEAD that I typed in earlier. So that's good. Now, uh, I don't know what these glitches are. I've not seen those before. It's because all your eyes are on. <laughs> <laughs> what we're going to do now is load something from paper tape. And so the way you do that is you do capital L. It doesn't like lowercase letters because those didn't exist in the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> What's his name? Real? The guy who does the kits? Right? Anyway, so he did a Kim One repro and did a really nice job of it and put a bunch of software out and did a, did a schematic and all the rest of that stuff. So this is software I stole from his site, but didn't credit him. So we're going to look at... Um, So here is the paper tape uh, for the clock demo. Is it Intel X format? <laughs> um, no, I think this is Kent Moss's own oh, Moss. thing. It's, 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 it's similar to that. It's something like, uh, here comes the data, here's the address, here's a bunch of data, here's a checksum going on the next one. So it's, it's something like that. Anyway, so we're going to do that. They have, and, tab in front of it? Um, they have a bunch of spaces. I think the idea is to give the software a little bit of time to think before the next line comes. Yeah. Although I'm not sure. Anyway, so here we go with one paste. We're going to watch this go in and hope that everything works properly. I don't, I don't hear the tape going. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's 300 baud, so it's a little different. Anyway, okay, so the fact that it did not give me an error is pretty remarkable. So the program starts at 200, and so we, if we do 0200G, Apple G, and of course it didn't work. So, uh, when in doubt, press reset. There we go. Okay. There we go. And there we go. There it is. So, it's actually counting up with roughly a, a, a second. Or just a software timing thing. And I apologize. I think what the problem is is that the, the, the current drive off the FPGA is not good enough to work with a multiplex display. And I probably should have put those inverters in to drive more. To drive more. Um, but the result is, there you go. And so you've got. So, uh, 20 bucks worth of hardware, uh, you know, $10,000 worth of time. 